there's a ministry of magic? Harry asked before he could stop himself. Of course, said Hagrid. They wanted Dumbledore for minister, of course. But he'd never leave our court. So old Cornelius Fudge got the job. Bungler, if there ever was one. So he bowed Dumbledore with house every morning, asking for advice. But what does the ministry of magic do? Well, their main job is to keep it from muggles. There's still witches and witches up and down the country. Why? Why, blimey Harry, everyone will be wanting magic solutions to their problems. Now, nah, we're best left alone. At this point, the boat bumped gently into the harbour wall. Hagrid folded up the newspaper, and they clambered up the stone steps onto the street. Passers-by stared a lot at Hagrid as they walked through the little town to the station. Harry couldn't blame them. Not only was Hagrid twice as tall as anyone else, he kept pointing at perfectly ordinary things like parking meters and saying loudly, see that Harry? Things these muggles dream up, eh? Hagrid, said Harry, panting a bit as he ran to keep up. Did you say there are dragons at Gringotts? Well, so they say, said Hagrid. Crikey, I'd like a dragon. You'd like one. What no one ever since I was a kid. Here we go. They had reached the station. There was a train to London in five minutes time. Hagrid, who didn't understand muggle money as he called it, gave the nose to Harry so he could buy their tickets. People stared more than ever on the train. Hagrid took up two seats and sat knitting what looked like a canary yellow circus den. Still got your letter, Harry? He asked as he counted stitches. Harry looked at the parchment envelope out of his pocket. Good. There's a list there of everything you need. Harry unfolded a second piece of paper he hadn't noticed the night before and read. Lockwood School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Uniform. First year students will require three sets of plain work robes, black. One plain pointed hat, black for day wear. One pair of protective gloves, dragon hide or similar. One winter cloak, black, silver fastings. Please note that all pupils' clothes should carry name tags. Set books. All students should have a copy of each of the following. The Standard Book of Spells, Grade 1, by Miranda Goshawk. History of Magic, by Bethilda Bagshaw. Magical Theory, by Adaba. A Beginner's Guide to Transfiguration by Air Mix Witch. 1000 Magical Herbs and Fungi by Validia Spore. Magic Drafts and Potions by Asinas Jigger. Fantastic Beats and Where to Find Them by Newt's Commander. The Dark Forces A Guide to Self Production by Quentin Trimble. Other Equipment 1 1 1 Cauldron. Pewter stands inside 2. A set of glass or crystal files. 1 telescope. 1 set of brass scales. Students may also bring an owl, or a cat, or a toad. Parents are reminded that first years are not allowed their own broomsticks. Can we buy all this in London? Harry wondered aloud. If you know where to go, said Hagrid. Harry had never been to London before, although Hagrid seemed to know where he was going. He was obviously not used to getting there in ordinary way. He got stuck in the ticket barrier on the underground, and complained that the seats were too small and the trains were too slow. Manage without magic, he said, as they climbed a broken down escalator which led up to the bustling road line with shops. Hagrid was so huge that he parted the crowd easily. All Harry had to do was keep close by. They passed bookshops, music stores, hamburger bars, and cinemas, but nowhere that looked as if it would sell you magic ones. This was just an ordinary street full of ordinary people. Could there really be piles of wizard gold buried miles beneath them? Were there really shops that sold spell books and broomsticks? Might this not all be some huge joke that the Dursleys had cooked up? If Harry hadn't known that the Dursleys had no sense of humour, he might have thought so. Yet somehow, even though everything Harry could have told him so far was unbelievable, Harry couldn't help but trusting him. This is it, said Hagrid, coming to a halt, the Leaky Cauldron. It's a famous place. It was a tiny, grubby-looking pub if Hagrid hadn't pointed it. Ow! Harry wouldn't have noticed it was there. The people hurrying by didn't glance at it. Their eyes slipped from one big bookshop to one side of the record shop. On the other side, as if they couldn't see the leaky cauldron at all. In fact, Harry had the most peculiar feeling that only in Hagrid could see it. Before he could mention this, Hagrid had steered him inside for a famous place. This was very dark and shabby. A few old women were sitting in the corner drinking tiny glasses of sherry. One of them was smoking a long pipe. A little man in a top hat was talking to the old barman. He was quite bored and looked. <laughs> and looked like a gummy walnut. 
The low buzz of chatter stopped when they walked in. Everyone seemed to know Hagrid. They waved and smiled at him, and the barman reached for a glass, saying, The usual Hagrid, can't Tom. I'm on Hogwarts business, said Hagrid, clapping his grey hand on Harry's shoulder and making Harry's knees buckle. Good lord, said the barman, peering at Harry. Is this, can this be, the leaky cauldron suddenly gone completely still and silent? Bless my soul, whispered the old barman, Harry Potter, what an honour. He hurried out from behind the bar, rushed towards Harry and seized his hands. Tears in his eyes, welcome back, Mr Potter, welcome back. Harry didn't know what to say, everyone was looking at him, the old one with the pipe was puffing on without realising it had gone out, Hagrid was beaming. Then there was a great scraping of chairs and the next moment Harry found himself shaking hand with everyone in the leaky cauldron. Doris Crockford, Mr Potter, can't believe I'm eating you at last, so proud Mr Potter, I'm just so proud. Always wanted to shake your hand, I'm all a flutter, delighted Mr Potter, just can't tell you. Diggle's the name, Dedalus Diggle. I've seen you before, said Harry. The Dedalus Diggle Top had fell off of his head in, so in excitement. You'd bow to me once in a shop. He remembers, cried Dedalus Diggle, looking around at everyone. Did you hear that? He remembers me. Harry shook hands again and again. Doris Crockford kept coming back for more. A pale young man made his way forward very nervously. One of his eyes was twitching. Professor Quirrell, said Hagrid. Harry, Professor Quirrell, will be one of your teachers at Hogwarts. Harry's hand. C can't tell you how p pleased I am to meet you. What sort of magic do you teach, Professor Quirrell? D defense against the d d dark arts, muttered Professor Quirrell. So uh, he'd rather not think about him. N not that you n need it, eh, b b b Potter? He laughed nervously. You'll be g getting all your equipment, I suppose. I've g got to p pick up a new b book on vampires m myself. He's looked terrified at the very thought, but others wouldn't let Professor Quirrell keep Harry to himself. It almost took ten minutes to get away from them all. At last, Hagrid managed to make himself heard over the babble. Must get on, lots to buy, come on Harry. Doris Crockford shook Harry's hand one last time and Hagrid led them through the bar and out into a small walled courtyard where there was nothing but a dustbin and a few weeds. Hagrid grinned at Harry, told you didn't I? Told you you're famous. Even Professor Quirrell was trembling to me, yeah, mind you. He's usually trembling. Is he always that nervous? Oh yeah, poor bloke, brilliant mind. He was fine while he was studying out of books, but then he took a year off to get some first-hand experience. They say he met vampires in the Black Forest. There was a nasty bit of trouble with the hag. Never been the same since. Scared of students, scared of his own subjects. Now, where's my own umbrella? Vampires, hags, Harry's head was swimming. Hagrid. Meanwhile, was counting bricks in the wall above the dustbin. Three up, two across, he muttered. Right, stand back, Harry. He tapped the wall three times with the point of an umbrella. The brick he had touched quivered. It wiggled in the middle. A small hole appeared. It grew wider and wider. A second later, they were facing an archway large enough even for Hagrid. An archway on the cobbled street with twisted and turned out of sight. Welcome, said Hagrid, to Diagon Alley. He grinned at Harry's amazement. He stepped through the archway. Harry looked quickly over his shoulder and saw the archway shrink instantly back into a solid wall. The sun, the sun shone brightly on a stack of cauldrons outside the nearest shop. Cauldrons of all sizes, copper, brass, pewter, silver, nearest shop. Self-staring, collapsible, said a sign hanging above them. Yeah, you'll be needing one, said Hagrid, but we gotta get your money first. Harry wished he had had about eight more eyes. He turned his head in every direction as they walked up the street, trying to look at everything at once. The shops, the things outside them, the people doing their shopping, a plump woman outside the, and a pot of the carries was shaking her head as they passed, saying, Dragon liver, seventeen sickles, an ounce, they're mad. A low soft hooting came from a dark shop with a sign saying, Ilops, Ow, Emporium, Tawny, Screech, Barn, Brown and Snowy. Several boys of about Harry's age had their noses pressed against the window with broomsticks in it. Look, Harry heard one of them say, the new Nimbus 2000, fast as ever. There were shops selling robes, shops selling telescopes, and strange silver instruments Harry had never seen before. Windows stacked with barrels of bat spleens and eels eyes, tottering piles of spell books, quills and rolls of parchment, potion bottles, globes of the moon, gringotts, said Harry reached a snowy white building which towered over 
of the other little shops standing beside it, banished bronze doors, wearing uniforms of scarlet and gold, was. Yeah, that's a goblin, said Hagrid quietly as they walked up to the white stones, steps towards him. The goblin was about to head shorter than Harry. He had a swarthy, clever face and a pointed beard, and Harry noticed very long fingers and feet. He bowed as they walked inside. Now, they were facing a second pair of doors, and silver this time, with words engraved upon them. Enter to stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take, but do not earn, must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure there. Like I said, you'd be mad to try and rob it, said Hagrid. A pair of goblins bowed to them through the silver doors, and they were in the vast marble hall. About a hundred more goblins were sitting on high stools behind a long counter, scribbling in large ledgers, weighing coins on brass scales, examining precious stones through eye glasses. There were too many doors to count leading off the hall, and yet more goblins were showing people in and out of these. Hagrid and Harry made their way for the counter. Morning, said Hagrid to a free goblin. We've come to take some money out of Mr. Potter's safe. You have his key, sir. Got it here somewhere, said Hagrid, as he started emptying his pockets on the counter, scattering a handful of mouldy dog biscuits over the goblin's book of numbers. The goblin wrinkled his nose. Harry watched the goblin on that right, weighing pile of three pieces big of glowing coals. Got it, said Hagrid at last. Holding up a tiny golden key, the goblin looked clo at it closely. That seems to be an order. And I've also got a letter here from Professor Dumbledore, said Hagrid importantly, throwing out his chest. It's about you know what, in Vault 713. The goblin read the letter carefully. Very well, he said, handing it back to Hagrid. I'll have to, I'll have someone take you down to both vaults, Gripbook. Gripbook was yet another goblin. Once Hagrid had crammed all the dog biscuits back inside his pocket, he and Harry followed Gripbook towards one of the doors leading off the hall. What's the you know what, in Vault 713, Harry asked. Can't tell you that, said Hagrid, mysteriously. Very secret Hogwarts business. Dumbledore's trust me. More of my job's worth to tell you that. Gripbook held the door open for them. Harry had expected more marble was surprised. They were in a narrow stone passageway lit with flaming torches. It sloped sleepily downwards, and there were little railway tracks on the floor. Gripbook whistled, and a small cart came hurtling up the tracks toward them. They climbed in. Hagrid with some difficulty, and were off. At first they just hurtled through a maze of twisting passages. Harry tried to remember left and right. Left, right, left. Middle fork, right. But it was impossible. The rattling cart seemed to know his own way because Gridbook wasn't steering. Harry's eyes stung as the cold air rushed past them, but he kept them wide open. Once he thought he saw a burst of fire at the end of a passage and twisted around to see if it was the dragon too late. They plunged even deeper, passing an underground lake, where huge stalactites and stalagmites grew from the ceiling and floor. I never knew, Harry called Hagrid over the noise of the car. What's the difference between a stalagmite and a stalactite? Stalagmite's got an M in it, said Hagrid. And don't ask me questions just now. I think I'm going to be sick. He did look very green. When the car stopped at last beside the small door in the passage wall, Harry got out and had to lean up against the wall and stop his knees from trembling. Gripper unlocked the door. A lot of green smoke came, billowing out. And as it cleared, Harry gasped inside were mounds of gold coins, columns of silver, heaps of little bronze nuts. All yours, smiled Hagrid. All Harry's. It was incredible. The Dursleys couldn't have known about this or they'd have had it further from him faster than blinking. How often had they complained how much Harry cost to keep? And all the time, there had been a small fortune belonging to him, buried deep under London. Hagrid helped Harry pass some of it into a bag. The gold ones are galleons, he explained. Seventeen silver sickles to a galleon and twenty-five nuts to a sickle. It's easy enough, right? That shouldn't be enough. That should be enough for a couple of terms. We'll keep the rest safe for you. He turned to Gridbook. Vault 713 now, please. And can we go more slowly? One speed early, said Gridbook. They were going even deeper now and gathering speed. The air becoming, becoming colder and colder as they hurtled round the tight corners. They went rattling over an underground ravine, and Harry leant over the side to try and see what was down at the bo dark bottom. But Hagrid kind of pulled him back by the scruff of his neck. Vault 713 had no keyhole. Stand back, said Gripbook importantly. He 
stroked the door gently with one of his long fingers and is simply mounted away. If anyone but a green cops goblin tried that, they'd be sucked through the door and trapped in there, said Gribbuk. How often do you check to see if anyone's inside? Harry asked. About once every ten years, said Gribbuk with a rather nasty grin. Something really extraordinary had to be inside the top security vault, Harry was sure. And he learned. He leant forward eagerly, expecting to see fabulous jewels at the very least. But at first he thought it was empty, then he noticed a grubby little package wrapped in brown paper lying on the floor. Hagrid picked it up and tucked it in deep inside his coat. Harry longed to know what was in it, but knew better than to ask. Come on. Back in the infernal cup, and don't talk to me on the way back. It's best to keep my mouth shut, said Hagrid. One while, cart right later, they stopped blinking in the sunlight. Outside Green Cops, Harry didn't know where to run first now. He had all the bag of money. He didn't have to know how many galleons there were to a pound to know that he was hoarding more than money than he'd had in his whole life, more than even the Dursleys ever, ever had. Might as well get your uniform, said Hagrid, nodding towards Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions. Listen, Harry, would you mind if I slipped off for a pick me up in the leaky cauldron? I hate them Gringotts carts. He did still look a bit sick. So Harry entered Madame Malcolm's shop alone, feeling nervous. Madame Malcolm was a squat, smiling witch dressed in all mauve. Hogwarts, dear, she said when Harry started to speak. Got the lot here. Another young man being fitted up just now, in fact. In the back of the shop, a boy with a pool, with a pale, pointed face, was standing on a footstool, while a second witch pinned up his long black robes. Madame Malcolm stood Harry on a stool next to him slipped a long road over his head and began to pin it on the front leg to the right leg even. Hello, said the boy. Hogwarts too? Yes, said Harry. My the father's next door buying my books and mother's up the street looking for one, said the boy. He had a bored, drawling voice. Then I'm going to drag them off to look at racing brooms. I don't see why first years can't have their own. I think I'll bully father into getting me one and I'll smuggle it somewhere. Harry was strongly reminded of Dudley. Have you got your own book? The boy went on. No. Play Quidditch at all? No. Harry said again, wondering what on earth Quidditch could be. I do. Father said it's a crime if I'm not picked to play for my house. And I must say, I agree. No, what house you'll be in yet? No, said Harry, feeling more stupid by the minute. Well, no one really knows until they get there, do they? But I know I'll be in Slytherin. All our family have been. Imagine being no. Imagine being in Hufflepuff. I think I'd leave, wouldn't you? Mm, said Harry, wishing he could say something a bit more interesting. I say, look at that man, said the boy, suddenly nodding, nodding towards the front window. Hagrid was standing there, grinning at Harry, pointing at two large ice creams to show he couldn't come in. That's Hagrid, said Harry, pleased to know something the boy didn't. He works at Hogwarts. Oh, said the boy, I've heard of him. He's sort of a servant, isn't he? He's the gameskeeper, said Harry. He was liking the boy less and less every second. Yes, exactly. I heard he's a sort of savage, lives in a hut in the school grounds, and every now and then he gets drunk and tries to do magic and ends up setting fire to his bed. I think he's brilliant, said Harry coldly. Do you? said the boy with a slight sneer. Why is he with you? Where are your parents? They're dead, said Harry shortly. He didn't feel much like going into the matter with this boy. Oh, sorry, said the other, not sounding sorry at all. But they were our kind, weren't they? They were witch and wizard, if that's what you mean. I really don't think they should let others sort in, do you? They're just not the same. They've never been brought up to know our ways. Some of them have never even heard of Hogwarts until they get the letter. Imagine. I think they should keep it to the old wizarding families. What's your surname, anyway? But before Harry could answer, Madame Malkin said, That's you done, my dear, said Harry. And Harry, not sorry for an excuse to stop talking to the boy, hopped down from the footstool. Well, I'll see you at Hogwarts, I suppose, said the drawling boy. Harry was rather quiet as he ate the ice cream. Hagrid had bought him chocolate and raspberry with chopped nuts. What's up? Nothing. Harry lied. They stopped by parch to buy parchment and quills. Harry cheered up a bit when he found a bottle of ink that changed colour as you wrote. When they had left the shop, he said, Hagrid, what's Quidditch? Blimey, Harry, I keep forgetting how little you know. Not knowing about Quidditch. Don't make me feel worse, said Harry. He told Hagrid about the pale boy and Madame Malkins, and he said some be said people from Muggle families shouldn't even be allowed in. You're not from a Muggle family, 
if he'd known who you were. He's grown up knowing your name if his parents are wizarding folk. You saw him in the Leaky Cauldron. Anyway, what does he know about it? Somehow, some of the best I ever saw were the only ones with magic in them. In a long line of muggles, look at your mum. Look what she had for a sister. So what is Quidditch? It's a sport. Wizard sport. It's like, like football in the muggle world. Everyone follows Quidditch. Played up in the air on broomsticks. And they're four balls. So hard to explain the rules. And what are Slytherin and Hufflepuff? Schoolhouses. There's four. Everyone says Hufflepuff with a lot of old duffers. But I bet I'm an Hufflepuff, said Harry gloomily. But I'm a Hufflepuff than Slytherin, said Hagrid darkly. There's not a single witch or wizard who went bad who wasn't in Slytherin. You know who was one. Vol. Sorry, you know who was at Hogwarts. Yeah, years and years ago, said Hagrid. They brought Harry's school books in the shop called Flourish and Blots, where the shelves were stacked to the ceiling with books as large as paving stones bound in leather. Books the size of potion stamps covered in covers in silk. Books full of peculiar symbols and a few books with nothing in them at all. Even Dudley, who never read anything, would have been wild to get his hands on some of these. Hagrid almost had to drag Harry away from the curses and counter curses. Bewitch your friends and befuddle your enemies. With the latest revenges, hair loss, jelly legs, tongue tying, and much more by Professor Vindictus Viridin. I was trying to find out how to curse Dudley. I'm not saying that's not a good idea, but you're not to use magic in the muggle world except in very special circumstances, said Hagrid. And anyway, you couldn't work any of them curses yet. You'll need a lot more study before you get to that level. Hagrid wouldn't let Harry buy a solid gold cauldron either. It says pewter on your list, but they got a nice set of scales for weighing potion ingredients and a collapsible brass telescope. They then visited the apothecaries, which was fascinating enough to make up its horrible smell, a mixture of bad eggs and rotted cabbages. Piles of slimy stuff stood on the floor. Jars of herbs, dried roots, bright powders lined the walls, bundles of feathers, strings of fangs, and snow claws hung up from the ceiling. While Hagrid asked the man behind the counter for a supply of some basic potion ingredients for Harry, Harry himself examined silver unicorn horns and twenty-one galleons each, and minuscule glittery black beetle eyes, five nuts a scoop. Outside the apothecaries, Hagrid checked Harry's list again. Just your one left. Oh yeah, and I still haven't got your birthday present. Harry felt himself go red. You don't have to. I know I don't have to. Tell you what, I'll get you an animal. Top toad. Toads went out of fashion years ago. You'd be laughed at. And I don't like cats. They make me sneeze. I'll get you an owl. All the kids want owls. They're dead useful. Carry your bows and everything. Twenty minutes later, they left Ilop's Owl Emporium, which had been dark and full of rusting and flickering. Jewel bright eyes. Harry now carried a large cage which held a beautiful snowy owl, fast asleep with her head under her wing. He couldn't stop stammering his thanks, sounded just like Professor Quirrell. Don't mention it, said Hagrid roughly. Don't expect you've had a lot of presents from the Dursleys. Just Ollivander's left now. Any place for wand, Ollivander's. And you got the best wand. A magic wand. This was what Harry had been really looking forward to. The last shop was narrow and shabby. Peeling gold letters over the door. Read Ollivander's. Makers of fine wands. Since 382 BC. A single wand lay on a faded purple cushion and dusty window. A tinkling bell ran somewhere in the depths of the shop. As they stepped inside it, it was a tiny place. Empty, except for a single spindly chair which Hagrid sat on to wait. Harry felt strange as though he had entered a very strict library. He swallowed a lot of new questions which had just occurred to him, and looked instead at thousands of narrow boxes piled neatly right up to the ceiling. For some reason, the back of his neck prickled, and the very dust and silence in it seemed to tingle with some secret magic. Good afternoon, said a soft voice. Harry jumped. Hagrid must have jumped too because there was a loud crashing noise, and he got quickly off the spindly chair. An old man was standing before them. His wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. Hello, said Harry awkwardly. Ah, yes, said the man. Yes, yes. I thought I'd be seeing you soon, Harry Potter. It wasn't a question. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was in here herself, buying her first wand. Ten and quarter inches, swishy made of willow. Nice wand for charm work. 
Mr. Oliphant moved closer to Harry. Harry wished he would blink. Those silvery eyes were a bit creepy. Your father, on the other hand, favoured a mahogany wand, 11 inches pliable, a little more power and excellent transfiguration. Well, I say your father favoured it. it. It's really the wand that chooses the wizard, of course. Mr. Oliphander had come so close that he and Harry were almost nose to nose. Harry could see, him res hate, see himself reflected in those misty eyes. And that's where Mr. Oliphant had touched the lightning scar on Harry's forehead with a long white finger. I'm sorry to say I sold the wand that did it, he said softly. Thirteen and a half inches, you. Powerful wand, very powerful. And in the warm hands, well, if I'd known what the wand was going to, going out into the world to do, he shook his head. And then, to Harry's relief, spotted Hagrid. Rubius, Rubius Hagrid, how nice to see you again. Oak, sixteen inches, rather bendy, wasn't it? It was, sir, uh, yes. Good one, that one. But I suppose they snapped in half when you got expelled, said Mr. Ollivander, suddenly stern. Uh, yes, they did, yes, said Hagrid, shuffling in his beak. I've still got the pieces, though, he added brightly. But you don't use them, said Mr. Ollivander, sharply. Oh, no, sir, said Hagrid quickly. Harry noticed the grip his pink umbrella became tightly as he spoke. Hmm, said Mr. Ollivander, getting Hagrid a piercing look. Well, now, Mr. Potter, let me see. He pulled a long tape measure with silver markings out of his pocket. Which is your wand arm? Uh, well, I'm right-handed, said Harry. Hold out your arm. That's it. He measured Harry from shoulder to finger, then wrist to elbow, shoulder to floor, knee to armpit, and the round of his head. As he measured, he said, every Ollivander wand has a core of a powerful magical substance, Mr. Potter. We use unicorn hairs, phoenix tail feathers, and the heart strings of dragons. No two Ollivander wands are the same, just as no two unicorns, dragons, or phoenixes are quite the same. And of course, you will never get such good results with another wand, wizard's wand. Harry suddenly realised what the tape measure, which was measuring between his nostrils, was doing. This on its own, Mr. Ollivander was flitting round the shelves, taking down boxes. That will do, he said. And the tape measure crumpled into a heap on the floor. Right then, Mr. Potter, try this, beechwood. And dragon heart string, nine inches, nice and flexible. Just take it and give it a wave. Harry took the wand and, feeling foolish, waved it around a bit. Mr. Ollivander snatched it out of his hand almost at once. Maple and Phoenix feather, seven inches, quite whippy. Try it. Harry tried, but he had hardly raised the wand when it, too, was snatched back by Mr. Ollivander. No, no, here. Ebony and unicorn hair, eight and a half inches, springy. Go on, go on, try it. Harry tried and tried it. He had no idea what Mr. Ollivander was waiting for. The pile of tried ones was not was mounting higher and higher on the spindly chair. But the more ones Mr. Ollivander bought from the shelves, the happier he seemed to become. Tricky customer, eh? Not to worry, we'll find the perfect match here somewhere. I wonder now, yes, why not? Unusual combination. Ollie and Phoenix feather, eleven inches, nice and supple. Harry took the wand, he felt a sudden warmth in his fingers, he raised the wand above his head, brought it swishing down through the dusty air, and a stream of red and gold sparks shot from the end of like a firework, throwing dancing spots of light on the walls. Hagrid whipped and clapped, and Mr. Ollivander cried, Oh, bravo indeed, oh, very good, well, 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 how curious, how very curious. He put Harry's wand back into its box and wrapped it in a brown paper. I'm still muttering curious, curious. Sorry, said Harry, but what's curious, Mr. Ollivander fixed with his pale stare. I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter. Every single wand. It so happens that the thing in the phoenix whose tail feather is in your wand and gave another feather. Just one other. This is very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand when its brother, when its brother gave you that scar. Harry swallowed. Yes, thirteen and a half inches. You. Curious indeed how these things happen. The wand chooses the wizard, remember? I think we must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. And after all, he must not be named to do great things. Terrible, yes, but great. Harry shivered. He wasn't sure he liked Mr. Ollivander too much. He paid seven gold galleons for his wand, and Mr. Ollivander bowed them from his shop. The late afternoon sun hung low in the sky as Harry and Hagrid made their way back down Diagon Alley, back through the wall. Through the leaky cauldron, now empty. Harry didn't speak at all as they walked down the road. He didn't even notice how much people were gawping at them on the underground, laden as they 
were all their funny shaped packages with the sleeping snowy arm on Harry's lap. Up another escalator. Out onto the out onto up another escalator out into Paddington Station. Harry only realised where they were when Hagrid tapped him on the shoulder. Got time for a bite to eat before your train leaves, he said. He bought Harry a hamburger and they sat down on the plastic seats to eat them. Harry kept looking around. Everything looked so strange somehow. You're alright, Harry. You're very quiet. Harry wasn't sure he could explain. He just had the best birthday of his life and yet he chewed his hamburger trying to find the words. Everyone thinks I'm special, he said at last. All those people in the leaky cauldron, Professor Quirrell, Mr. Ollivander. But I don't know anything about magic at all. How can they expect great things? I'm famous and I can't even remember what I'm famous for. I don't know what happened when Fault. Sorry, I mean, the night my parents died. Hagrid leant across the table, behind the wild beard and eyebrows. He wore a very kind smile. Don't you worry, Harry. You'll learn fast enough. Everyone starts at the beginning of Hogwarts. You'll be just fine. Just be yourself. I know it's hard. You've been singled out, and that's always hard. But you'll have a great time, Hogwarts. I did. Still do. As a matter of fact. Hagrid helped Harry out. in his seat and pressed his nose against the window, but he blinked and Hagrid was gone. <laughs>